perfectionism is the devil incarnate. So what Mark yeah. wrote was, hi all, we have was having lunch with a mate recently. You can tell he's from Australia because he was having lunch with a mate. He wasn't having lunch with a friend. And no, no, that's right. <laughs> that's recently, right. And he told me something which I found very helpful. I thought me, might be relevant for my fellow artists out there. One of the things that Anne mentions is a great obstacle for artists is perfectionism. I know I've been guilty of this and it's held me back in my artwork for more than I care to remember. My mate used to be the same way until his pastor said to him, stop thinking of yourself as a perfectionist. Good suggestion. Rather, think of yourself as someone who maintains a standard of excellence. He said it removed the negative connotation from his efforts to always doing things well and gave him permission to do things his best mm. without having to be perfect. This really hit home with me, and I felt like I was finally given permission to work to achieve a standard in my art, but without the impossible burden of each piece having to be perfect. Helped me a lot, and I hope it's a value to you as well. And also, I hope it's okay. Yeah, so it was obviously a value because we had like a ton of comments after yes. this. And this is one of the subjects that I cover in the program. I talk about perfectionism. I liked his advice, but another my uh, the way I like to frame it is progress, not perfection. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Things about pro thing about perfection is first of all, it doesn't exist. Right. Yep. So why would you chase a goal that you're never going to attain? Number one. Yep. Number two, when you're perfectionistic, you're incredibly inefficient. You waste time, you waste money, and you waste effort. It's very right. inefficient. There's in software development, there's the, um, the iterative approach, the agile right. development approach where they just go, they just, these are people who have to be very, very precise too, right? They're coding new software, mm -hmm. but they understand that they just need to create what's called a minimal viable product and get yeah. it to a place where it's functional and then examine what works, examine what doesn't and iterate. So you'll hear me say iterate a lot in this program because that's what you're doing as an artist too. You just yeah. do your best, you have a critique, it's just as important to say what's working as it is to say what's not. So the tendency of perfectionists is they look on the dark side and they yeah. look at all the flaws and they don't have a good look and appreciation for all the things that are right. Yeah. So yeah. My, I would just say, I would just say do whatever works for you, works for you. But the mantra of progress, not perfection, I found very useful because that's all we can do anyway. Yeah, and it's very punishing. And there's a book that is, I think it's in the recommended reading list for mm -hmm. the program called mm -hmm. Art and Fear. If you don't have the book Art and Fear, you've got to get the book Art and Fear. And I, it's just a thin little volume and yep. goes straight to the chapter on perfectionism. Skip all okay. the other chapters. Just go to that chapter and read what it says. In summary, there is a... Uh, ceramics class and it's divided intentionally into two groups one group their job their homework is to make the perfect ceramic vessel right Only one just one right to make perfect this yeah. side over here they're going to be graded not on the quality but on the amount of clay they use so they're just supposed to be making vessels just make vessels now yeah. they're not going to be sloppy or haphazard about it but just make as many as you can because the more that you weigh in at the end of the semester, the higher your grade is. So which group, A or B, do you think had the biggest increase in quality and skill? I've put a lot of money into, you know, learning marketing and that before where I've done courses and things like that because as an artist, I knew that that was the, one of the pieces of the puzzle that was missing. But every time I did them, nothing what? So I just thought, oh, these courses are a waste of money. I've lost so much in the past. I'm not going to do it again. You know, and then the difference with yours was that I thought, okay, this is an artist who's teaching artists how to do this. So I thought there's got to be something different in the way you're doing it than in the regular business model, which didn't work for me at all. So that was one of the challenges. Um, the other one was um, I was at a Comic Con uh, in Redding, California, not so long ago, and I met one of the Marvel artists, uh, Walden Wong, who you know we got along really well. And he just said to me, "Look, if you really want to 
you know, be full time as an artist and become a professional, you've got to let go of the trying to work full time and then do it on the weekends and evenings as a kind of hobby. You've got to make that commitment where you go, this is going to be my full time thing. You know, I'm, I'm committed to this. Traditional business training and marketing training is designed to sell goods or services. Yes. An artist product is not, we don't sell goods or services. We sell emotion. That's you, right. Yeah. It, you either ignite an emotional response in your collector, your buyer, or you don't. That yeah. music wants to make you dance or it doesn't. And yes. So traditional business and marketing plans and training doesn't account for that. And that leaves no. artists adrift. You're the second person I spoke to today who's invested a lot of time, money, and frustration yep. in marketing classes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's so, right. There might be bits and pieces that you can still apply, yep. but until yep. you're clear on your target market and your value proposition, those mm. other pieces are going to be very difficult for you to reconcile. Like, well, what do I do with this knowledge? I don't know how the hell to use it, right? So that's saying it's not all. It may not all be lost what you've learned. Right, right. right. You've got to get this piece right. You've got to crack your four part code. You have yep. to test your value proposition yep. through your prototype project, and yep. at a minimum, and I want to emphasize at a minimum, earn back your tuition investment through the sale of your art during your final project, not Absolutely. before. That's great if you do it before. We like that, but that's not the requirement. I used to overwork pieces because I thought, no, it's not quite right, it's not quite right. And then it gets to the point where you kind of cross this line and you've ruined it to a degree. You know, just the colors have become muddy or it's so overshaded that you can't get it back. And so I've learned to sort of go, all right, it's not perfect, but it looks good. And I know if I do more, I'm going to ruin it. I'm going to stuff it up. So I just back up and just leave it. And then maybe look at it in a couple of days or something like that. The question you have to ask is, what are you thinking mm. when you're doing that? What's the underlying belief? And I can tell you already, for you perfectionists yep. out there, you yep. don't want to be criticized. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and that's true that you're going to save yourself from being criticized, but you're right. not. No, that's true too. Yeah. 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 And the only crit, the really in terms of selling your art, the only criticism that matters is your target markets. Nobody else who cares? No, yeah. who cares? Yeah, and yeah. you are your biggest critic. critic. Yeah. yeah. So, Managing that voice, I mean, I use, you can use meditation, you can use exercise, but you know, you've got to do something to observe that narrative that's saying, it's not perfect, it's wrong, it's wrong. You know, you have to be, if like, think of a small child who mm -hmm. you're teaching something new to, mm -hmm. you would be kind, you'd be gentle, you'd meet them where they are. Yeah, yeah. And if they're getting fatigued, you'd say, all right, let's have a rest. Yeah. Let's come back to it later. You can keep forcing them because it wouldn't work. What I would honestly tell someone is I would say, if you are serious about wanting to use your art and become look, either a full-time artist or make a living out of your artist, then I would say then I would say you need to, you really should invest in the course. I'd say if you're not serious, then keep doing what you're doing. But if you want to make that jump from that leap from being a hobby, just umming and ahhing, not making that that scary commitment, so to speak, then dive in and do it. Because even just after finishing the first course, um, it's clear how much more insight it's given me, and just the just just the confidence and the various activities. They kind of it starts to peel back all those various obstacles. That as as you say, you've got to get rid of the psychological stuff and get that clear first, and then you can build on the practical stuff because as long as those obstacles are there, it doesn't matter what you learn, you're not going to move forward. And it's a really good way of doing it. You know, I thought that was great. So yeah, that's what I'd say to them. I'd say, if you're really serious, then you should really do it. If you're not serious, then just keep doing what you're doing. So yeah. Yes. If you want to take your art to another level, just a more, you know, authentic, honest, serious level, then I'd say it's worth doing, even if you didn't want to do it full time.